It's been some time since I was last at St. Augustine's, and so it's, it's good to be back with you on this very important occasion, the celebration of Catherine's new ministry in your midst. And so I'm glad to see so many of you here and so many faces of people that I've known for, I won't say many years, because then we all start feeling old, but for a good piece of time. As we gather tonight to celebrate Catherine's new ministry here amongst us, in the parish of St. Augustine, we do so at a time when we are ever more aware of the fragility of human life and of our need for human solidarity in compassion and attentiveness to the needs of the many, even at the inconvenience of the few. Times such as these usually begin with concern, sometimes even engender fear, and in the worst case, can lead us into unreasoning panic. In such circumstances as these, the spread of biological, to stop the spread of biological and spiritual viruses, our need for wisdom increases exponentially. So I find myself in a familiar situation tonight. More often than I can remember, the mechanics of the liturgical year move in unexpected ways to bring into contact the various dimensions of our lives. This is one such occasion. Long before tonight was planned, long before COVID-19 entered our vocabulary, the church chose to remember Gregory of Nyssa on the ninth day of March. Now, Gregory, for those of you who don't know his life intimately, like most of us here, I'm sure, we all, all know Gregory of Nyssa. I say that with a bit of humor, I hope. <laughs> Gregory of Nyssa was the younger brother of Basil the Great, a fifth century theologian who was a powerhouse, who bullied his brother Gregory into becoming a bishop. Gregory wanted to simply remain a quiet lawyer in a quiet provincial town, and, and Basil wanted more bishops on the local college of bishops to get what Gre Basil wanted done in the area. So Gregory, being the dutiful younger brother, allowed himself to be bullied into becoming a bishop, and then turned out to be quite good at it. Until the people, this cantankerous flock of people in Nyssa got angry with him one time and threw him out of town. Something I don't expect to happen here at St. Augustine, I would hasten to, hasten to add. Um, but it is you know, one of those hazards one faces in ministry. You sometimes end up telling people things they don't want to hear. Uh, as long as you try to do it in a fair and pastoral way, it's pretty good. But Greggy learned and grew into the role and they led him back into town and then he led a rather great life as a bishop what he did most of his life was to seek wisdom. We hear in the prayer for him tonight about the ascent of life, the ascent into the glory of God. And for Gregory, wisdom was the vehicle that led us to experience, it leads us into experiencing this glory. And he did this kind of searching for wisdom, even as he tended the many duties of the diocese. So tonight, we hear this glorious passage from the wisdom of Solomon. I always think it's unfortunate that many people don't have all of the books of the Bible and don't have books, Bibles with the so-called deuterocanonical books, which are just filled with incredible passages of beauty and power. So I want you to hear it again in a slightly different translation. Wisdom is more mobile than anything that moves. She pervades and embraces everything because she is so pure. Wisdom is the warm breath of God's power. She pours forth from the all-powerful one's pure glory. Therefore, nothing impure can enter her. She's the brightness that shines forth from eternal life, light. She's a mirror that flawlessly reflects God's activity. 
She's the perfect image of God's goodness. She can do anything since she's one and undivided. She never changes, and yet she makes everything new. Generation after generation, she enters souls and shapes them into God's friends and prophets. God doesn't love anything as much as people who make their home with wisdom. She's more splendid than the sun and more wonderful than the arrangement of the stars. She's even brighter than sunlight, for night follows day, but evil can never overcome wisdom. Every time I hear those words, every time I read those words, when I ponder them, I find myself saying, Lord God Almighty, I sure do wish I was a wise man. Because it sounds really good. It really sounds what I'd like to be. With that kind of clarity of vision, that kind of sight about what God is working on. You see, wisdom is not slogans. And we live in a world that seems to confuse slogans with wisdom and with leadership. It's not a kind of world in which wisdom sometimes seems to stand a chance. You know, you and I may think of ourselves as knowledgeable people, but without any experience of putting that knowledge to work for the common good, we are not wise. We may consider, even consider ourselves people of some experience. But if that experience is not seasoned with compassion and hope, then we are not yet wise. We may bring together knowledge and experience that is compassionate and hopeful, but if we are not humble enough to know what we don't know, and if we don't possess enough patience to watch for the signs of the new world God is bringing into being, then we are not wise. But I do believe that every one of us here tonight is trying to be wise. Otherwise, we would not be here tonight. When I was teaching at VST, I had the privilege of spending more than 20 years working in the Native Ministry Program, working with elders and others from many communities across this province and elsewhere. And I remember, as I think back on those times, that every time I was seeing wisdom at work, I was seeing wise people at work, it was a very challenging experience because it threw a lot of my expectations into real questions about what was going on. I remember vividly one time at a meeting, a small group meeting, it came to lunchtime and we hadn't made any arrangements for lunch and I said to the assembled folk, I'm really sorry I can't invite you down to my house for lunch because my house was attached to the building and I said I'm really sorry because I didn't plan for a bunch of people and so I didn't do it, so I really am sorry. Uh, to which one of the elders, in a very gentle way, not a judgmental way, just a friendly way, said to me, you know, that's one of the differences between us. In a house, we just say, come on down, and we'll figure it out. And I remember that moment of genuine wisdom, compassion. It was not said in judgment. It was just simply, oh, this is interesting. This is a difference, you know? This compassion, this hopefulness, this patience with this young professor who was trying to figure out this role. So it didn't surprise me that when the Niska people established a post-secondary educational institution in the Nass Valley some years ago, they pondered what to call it. The name they finally chose was Wilkwahaskul Niska, which means the, the Niska House of Wisdom. What a challenging name to live into. <coughs> Under its roof, knowledge and experience, compassion and hope have been and are nurtured in a spirit of patience. Patience for a time which is yet to come when they can live a full and equal life in this country. But here we are. And I need to say to you, friends, that here in St. Augustine's, we are gathered in just such a house of wisdom. This is a house of wisdom. 
It is first and more commonly understood to be a house because it has four walls and a roof. Within these walls and under this roof, we hear the scriptures, we offer our prayers, and we share in the sacrament of the table. These words, spoken, sung, and enacted, guide us towards the path of God's wisdom, a wisdom more splendid than the sun and more wonderful than the arrangement of the stars, brighter than sunlight. Whether we see it or not, wisdom fills this place. But never forget that the word house has a double meaning, both in Niska and in English. To speak of a house is to speak of a physical building, but it is also to speak of a family, one's house. We have here in this congregation a house. Some of you come from a lineage of families that have been part of this congregation for a very long time. A lineage of blood. But most of us here are related to each other because we share in a desire to participate in a patient pilgrimage where knowledge and com compassionate and hopeful experience are held together, are partnered together, companion one another. In us, in our own flesh and blood, the wisdom of God seeks a home. And one need only go out the front door to recognize that Marpole needs a house, a home, a place of wisdom, a place where people can come and share in this journey towards genuine fullness of humanity. So Catherine, may wisdom breathe in you and through you as you lead this flock. And to all of you who are members of St. Augustine's, may wisdom shape you into God's friends and prophets. May this house, both its building and its people, shine with God's eternal light here in Marple and beyond. May this house, both building and people, mirror God's compassionate activity. And may all of us make a home with wisdom.